Good morning, everybody, and a very warm welcome back to New Music Dublin and to this concert entitled Gaia, which features uh, music from composers, including Deirdre McKay, who's joined me this morning. Good morning, Deirdre. Um, Good morning. This whole Gaia project is a co-commission between various festivals, um, including there's us, there's the Sound Festival, which is a Scottish contemporary music festival based up in Aberdeen. Um, there's King's Place in London and also I think the Royal Northern College of Music in Manchester. I think those are the four partners in total. And it involves uh, music by various composers focusing upon really kind of ecological and um, earth urgent problems, really, I could we could say. And is the brainchild partly of flautist Ruth Morley and singer um, Laura Bowler. You workshopped these works last year um, in New Music Dublin as a kind of preamble showing and we heard little bits of the work um did we not did we last year mm -hmm. i suppose i was going to ask you just very briefly a little bit if you don't mind just introducing yourself um and uh saying who you are where you come from <laughs> and how you got into composing Ooh. because the work that you've created to, for this is yeah. very um uh ecologically aware and i was interested in how you Ooh. combined your artistic practice with your um, fairly obviously um, strong belief in ecological mm. matters. Okay, so, well, the beginning question, uh, how did I get into composing, <laughs> um, was was accidental and unaware, I guess. Um, I was about eight years old <laughs> when I had started to learn violin, which I thought was the most insanely beautiful, gorgeous, magical thing I'd ever experienced. Not my playing, I should say, but uh, the teachers. So she kind of played this little wooden box and I thought it was like real life magic, like proper magic. So I was kind of totally smitten. And I suppose a few months into that, I decided that some of my weekly homeworks were not setting me on fire. <laughs> Um, uh, well, because I had had the joy of playing like Twinkle Twinkle and Bobby Shafto, and I thought they were stellar. And then thought some of the homeworks after that were not as sparkly. So I decided that I knew at least five notes, and therefore, like maybe if I jumbled them all up and did things, that maybe I could make something else that was quite sparkly. Um, and that was probably the beginning of me accidentally becoming a composer, I suppose, or composing without having any awareness of what I was doing and getting worried that I would get in trouble for doing it as well. <laughs> um, I do remember thinking, maybe this is bold, like maybe I, I haven't given permission to this, maybe I'll get in trouble. Um, yeah, so that was kind of the beginning of things. That's really beautiful. And <laughs> you've uh, made quite a career for yourself, actually, as a composer, so those five notes uh, major thing. Do you still only use five? You know, I branched out. <laughs> I kind of felt four just didn't cover it. So yeah, yeah, yeah. There was there was definitely other notes to explore. Um, but, you know, I'll be honest, John, and you're a composer. So I mean, I kind of think, in some ways, nothing changes. I don't think that the process of writing for orchestra or choir or string quartet or flute and voice is much different. I only had my little fiddle and it didn't sound good and I didn't sound good. <laughs> but the kind of process of imagining and wanting to create and exploring and I don't know, I kind of, there's an innocence in it that is the same if no matter what age you are and there's a sort of I don't know, I, it's, there is a kind of sort of joy that you hope to uh, hit with it that I, that I remember when I was eight and excited to try out my first little experiment. I had no idea what I was doing, but I don't think actually, I, I remember doing it and I remember the feeling and I think it's exactly the same the whole way through. <laughs> There's something that's actually a lovely, lovely, lovely story, I have to say. I um, you know, I, I suspect a lot of musicians, whatever, whatever path they end up traveling, have a similarly kind of almost visceral story to tell about a lack of awareness, but knowing that that was the thing, that was the thing that brought yeah. them that feeling that they wanted to recapture every time. I'm, yeah. I'm actually sort of overjoyed to hear that you're sort of 
the, the, the joy you felt as a child is still present as an adult actually you know yeah. to be honest about it you know most adults don't feel the joy they had as a child very frequently so i suspect you're a very lucky person in being able well, to in some way. well i mean it's tough i mean i think composing is really tough i mean there's you know it's it's a tough you know and if, if, if a piece isn't going well you will be heartbroken <laughs> there's just no two ways about it so um but i think the sort of joy in wanting to create something that is somehow you know brings you to another level or just that you find very moving or very beautiful or very affecting or you know i think it's the emotional kind of um hit that you will get in creating something that you're really drawn into that that's kind of the same, you know, so it's, yeah, so I think, yeah, it's a complex thing, but it has uh, the potential for a lot of joy and beauty within it. Yeah. So tell us about your uh, work for Gaia. A little. Okay, so, yeah, so the theme um, came from Laura and Ruth, and they very gently asked me to respond to it, which actually was really critically important. Um, I think, you know, if, if somebody's kind of drawing you into something and they do it really, really gently, it just, it just, I remember that early conversation, which was really long time ago now, you know, that, um, and just the gentleness with which they invited me to respond to it really made the field feel wide open. It was actually really important. Um, and immediately I kind of knew that I would focused on a couple of different subjects that felt really important. Um, so I was also really conscious they were two breath instruments. So, and I had just come on off a really rough time with asthma that year. Um, so I really needed to know that they would have a break, you know, to breathe. Um, and so it ended up being two, two, what ended up being two postcards, sort of, they're kind of like postcards sent to another planet, I suppose a cry for help maybe. Um, if there's any planets nearby that could help us out <laughs> but um yeah there was sort of yeah sort of just be really being aware of the sort of fragility of where we're at you know in lots of ways and um i think as well like the more i mean we have an incredible planetarium in uh, armagh and it really is staggering if you kind of you know if you kind of absorb what's going on if you it sort of makes you realize how precious earth is you know a lot of the plants are pretty inhospitable to life they're extraordinarily hot or extraordinarily cold um and you know acidic and you just they're not going to support life and we have this incredible planet um in which we can experience sound which became a big obsession of mine for a while you know that for the vastness of the universe that you know to experience live instruments you know which have been crafted over hundreds of years by masters and skill passed on and you know it's just it really is pretty mind-blowing and you know we have this incredible incredible resource and we're not taking care of it you know I say so collectively and you know so that's really powerful and affecting and with the two postcards the first one was really I was setting data I was just setting scientific data I knew that I wanted it to just be really straightforward respect the science, respect where we're at. And I was setting the sort of science of um, atmospheric carbon, which is quite staggering actually, once you kind of get into the figures. And I happened to see footage of uh, the 45th president of the United States um, speaking at a, a rally, really at a, a conservative student rally in Palm Beach, West Palm Beach, Florida. Now this was sort of the year before in a really important election year and it was just a couple of weeks after the then president had formally initiated withdrawal of the United States from the International Paris Accord on climate change. So it was a very impactful speech for that reason, I think, because it was real, it was happening that you know, the United States were being withdrawn from the Paris Accord, which had every potential to completely topple this kind of global commitment to uh, restraining global warming. So, um, yeah, so it was huge. It was really, I kind of saw this speech, it kind of knocked me off my chair and went into work again and I couldn't concentrate and that went on for days. And then I realized that I couldn't get back to where I had been setting this data about atmospheric carbon until I kind of dealt with um, what I had seen in the speech, which was really taking on wind energy and being, um, yeah, giving some strong views in that which were not 
quite respectful of the science of things and that really disturbed me actually I think there's sort of been this very strange wave of anti-science rhetoric which has grown somehow inexplicably in the last few years and that really concerned me and having lots of students cheering this voting age students um, the year before a really critically important election and um, so it just kind of it just took hold of my concentration I couldn't get past it and set it really so that I could clear it from my mind wow gosh it sounds <laughs> almost like I wouldn't say this is not to denigrate the idea but it's almost like kind of um composition as therapy that somehow you have to use it to clear your mind this this thing that I'm maybe just saying that actually you know somehow you have to sort of almost brain dump this down into this yeah it's outside of you it's no longer actually inside your inside your head eating away at you and so mm. I mean that's a very powerful very very powerful idea I'm um I've even though this work has been done before as part of the circuit we've never actually heard this performance before so um we're just about to go uh, now to listen to um, Ruth Morley and Laura Bowler performing these works and uh, this was actually recorded earlier this week in Glasgow as I understand it correctly so we very much hope that you enjoy this work and thank you very much indeed Divri for joining us today take care of yourself thank you thank you we'll have a an economy based on wind. to the universe. Oh! <laughs> 
You talk about the carbon footprint. Fumes are spewing into the air, right? Spewing. Whether it's in China, Germany, it's going into the air, it's our air, their air, everything. Right?
We can eat problems. 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 All unique and thus irreducible and difficult to conceptual voice and anticipate. Likewise, they are unverifiable. 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 If we say global warming, we will never be able to prove that it would have destroyed the earth. Uh, 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 uh. We can eat problems. 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 Problems, we keep 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 problems,
problems, wicked problems, wicked problems. All the actual solutions that drastically alter facts. No trial runs, no reverse gears, no attempts to solve wicked problems. No trial runs, no reverse gears, no attempts to solve wicked problems. No trial runs, no reverse gears, no attempts to solve wicked problems. Irreversibility. So um, sustainable capitalism might be one of those contradictions in terms, along the lines of military intelligence. Capital must keep on producing more of itself in order to continue to be itself. This strange paradox is fundamentally structurally imbalanced. Let's consider the unit of capitalism, the turning of raw materials into products. Now, for a capitalist, the raw materials are not strictly natural. They simply pre-exist whatever labour process the capitalist is going to exert on them. Surely here we see the problem. Whatever pre-exists the specific labour process is a kind of lump that only achieves definition as valuable product once the labour has been exerted on it. What capitalism makes is some kind of stuff called capital. The very definition of raw materials and economic theory is also stuff that comes in through the factory door. Again, it doesn't matter what it is. It could be sharks or it could be steel bolts. At either end of the process, we have featureless chunks of stuff, one of those featureless chunks being human labor. The point is to convert the stuff that comes in to money, 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 to money. Thank you.